It's funny to me. I get big family and only me. Maybe God they try to tell me something to, you know, you better you stay and, uh, you know, prayer. Prayer, that's the only way you can do. So I think, you know, I'm not too sure. Only God knows what, why they would make me sick. And, and my family is not. She's lived what most folks would call a tough life, diagnosed at 18 with Hansen's disease, a husband who left her and took their young son with him, surviving the passing of her second husband. But with her deep faith in God, Meili Watanuki found comfort. Today, her enveloping smile conveys a sense of peace and happiness. She stays busy as manager of the Kalau Papa store, and she and her third husband have two homes, one right on the beach. But life in the settlement is not without controversy. Later, we'll also talk with bookstore operator, patient Clarence Boogie Kahilihiva, and compare the patient's thoughts on the long-standing ban against allowing children into Kalau Papa. But first, let's meet Meili Watanuki on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. In this edition of Long Story Short, you'll meet the woman behind the counter at Kalau Papa store. She's a central figure in a town of about 100 people, mostly state and federal workers. There are fewer than 20 Hansen's disease patients left. Sooner or later, if you're in Kalau Papa, you'll drop in at the store for a snack or a drink, or just to talk story like we did, which is where we met Meili Watanuki. After a quick visit at the store, she drives me to her beach house. There are so many vacant state homes, some patients maintain two. Here on the outskirts of town on a hot summer day in 2009, we take seats on the lanai. This is Meili Watanuki's Long Story Short, which begins in her native Samoa. What was your early life like before Hansen's disease? Go school. And those days uh, in American Samoa, is, my family is poor. So I was in a school, a uh, Catholic school in American Samoa. Then my, um, my father and my sister, you know, they cannot get money for paying my, my school. Those days, it's about 50 cents, you know, those days. Then they would take me away from school because you know, I was, uh, you know, just about sixth grade, but they wouldn't take me away. So I go, uh, you know, public school, and uh, after that, I, I, I never finished my school. So I stay home, uh, you know, to uh, help, uh, you know, my nephew and my nieces to clean their, wash their clothes, cook for them, you know, and I help my sisters. Yeah. How old were you then when you dropped out of school? I think, uh, you know, that time I was about 14. Yeah. And when did Hansen's disease enter your life? Uh, was 1952. It's about 18. I was 18 already at that time. How much fear was there in your town about leprosy? I thought that, you know, when you go in a hospital queen, you know, and then it says, uh, uh, it come out about, you know, three, three, four days. I, when I found out at that time, you know, you cannot come out, you know, until maybe, uh, you know, according to doctor, they tell me the first time, um, maybe you can stay about, you know, a few months. And that's why they went click in my mind and I will start to really cry because you know, it's the first time I, you know, I get that kind of sick, but I don't know how I went get. So my sister, they come and visit me. So then I stay about, uh, you know, six months. And then uh, 1952, and all of the hands and in American Samoa, there was Fiji Island. Because there was? 
treatment. There was yeah. a way to arrest they the disease. They already get the, you know, the, you know, the medicine, yeah. So, so you never had to worry that you were going to die because of Hansen's disease? No, I just worry that because, you know, just like it's a jail, you know what I mean? And American Samoa so strictly, when in a, in a, they get a cage, uh, they get all around the hospital. When the doctor come in, uh, you know, to go inside the hospital, they get big kind top. They can find so. Whenever they they go in, the you know the compound where all the patient, mm -hmm. and then when they go out, they take out their shoes. They they go on top and stand inside the, the top with the, you know clean the feet. How did that make you feel when you saw that? Oh, uh, they would make me more scared. Were, was your family afraid of you? No. My family, uh, you know, because. When I came back from, uh, uh, you know, Western Samoa, they take me in hospital. And then I found out that uh, my sister, she died. So uh, her kids, they come see me. They never get scared. They just come hug me. In the days before there was effective treatment, a woman with Hansen's disease had to give up her child to be raised by others. In the 1960s, there was hope that you could be cured of the disease and that someday you'd be reunited with your child. In the case of Mei Li Watanuki, it was not her disease that kept her from reconnecting with her son. So how did you get to Honolulu? Okay, <laughs> so when uh, I paroled, you know. They called it a parole? Yeah, parole just like you discharge from the the sickness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Hansen's disease. So my stepsister was here, and my stepmother. They are, uh, you know, they know that I went discharged from uh, uh, October the 19th, uh, 1958. So uh, you know, they told me to come here in Hawaii. And I said, well, I'm not too sure, but. Uh, they say, you come, come, uh, you know, you just come out from the hospital, yeah. So that's why I came away. And then I married, and then they went, um, you know, I moved out, so. You thought all your troubles were behind you? You got married? Yes. Yeah. Did you have a baby? Yeah, I have one child, it's a boy. So 1964, I just see it, because I you know when I come somewhere, you know, I don't know where to go pick up the, my medicine. So I thought it's finished already. And up, uh, you know, they said, uh, you know, you're supposed to go take your medicine. I said, no, I, I did not because I don't know the hospital. So I went go take tests. And um, there's a few weeks and it, uh, Dr. Hersey, they called me. I said, yeah, you set up something with your baby and uh, your husband and then, and then you gotta go at the Halemohalu. I say, oh, fine, you know. And I feel that, uh, you know, I, I better not stay there because with my baby, I don't want my baby to get sick. Yeah, because he's too young, they're only three years old. Yeah. So I set up things and I talk to my husband. And my husband, they think, you know, just like you go hospital, you know, and a few days come back. <laughs> but end up, there was not. Then uh, he came to uh, visit me with my son, and they see, uh, you know, all the fans around. But they kept playing the other Filipinos there too at Hanemoalu. So they was talking about and and he said, oh, they talk Filipino, you know, and then end up. That, that was the last day I, I see him and my son. They never come back. So they saw the fence, they, yeah. they heard the talk, yeah. and your husband took your son away? Yeah, they take my son away. So that you didn't see your son from the time he was three no. to the time he was in college? No. Did you have contact? Yeah, we never contacted because you could not I don't find know him. how, you know. And, uh, you know, but that, that lady was so nice to me. And the mayor, they sent me uh, his picture and, uh, and, and his address. 
when I look here, yeah, it was my son, but big already, the boy. So then I went to um, try to contact a social worker, the state social worker. Then, uh, you know, her and I, we worked together. So finally, we contact him, you know. I called him in Philippines, and I ended up, you know, he wants to come back. So I told him, fine. Uh, what I gonna do? So I asked what's happened. Uh, the father said the father they will remarry and they um, uh, they buy one house and the father he died and then up the stepmother when uh, kick him out from the house. Yeah. I said uh, that is uh, you know I think so that lady they get blessing for you. So okay, I try to bring you back. I bring him back here. You know, uh, me and social worker, we was work together at that time. So we, uh, he came, and then um, me and my husband, we tried to uh, take him back to uh, college to finish up here in Hawaii. But you know, when you are not taking care of your son when small and grow up, and just like then they won't listen to me because it's a different life. Did you ever? Achieve a no. bond with him. Yeah. So you lost your son at three. Yeah. And even though you tried, he was never part of a bond again. You seem so matter of fact when you talk about it. Does it? How much does it still hurt? I know you've talked about it. You've had time to deal with it. But how are you with it? I feel hurt. It's hard for me, but Randall, they're trying to um, go, uh, help him and tell him, you know, your mom loves you, I you know that. You can do whatever you want to do, but he loves you. They find a job, supposed to work over here at that time, but... And, and now nothing? Nothing. They never come back, they never call, no right, so... I just let it go. Like other patients living at Kalau Papa in 2009, Meili Watanuki is free to go, but she chooses to live there. She was deprived of her liberty for years, and when the cure came, she was exposed to the stigma, fear, and prejudice that Hansen's disease patients of the 1960s encountered. Out of that experience, patients came to view a life at Kalau Papa with state support, not as exile, but as refuge. Why did you come to Kalau Papa? You, you, you weren't banished, you didn't have to live here. No, because, uh, you know, I feel that, uh, I feel happy because when I came here, there was really good, you know, and they tell me, uh, you know, you know, anytime, you can go Honolulu, you can go uh, Las Vegas, you can go any place, but this is your home. So, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> and I was really, really happy, you know, to stay here. And how's your health? My health is, uh, is okay, only uh, I have asthma, you know, so it's taking care, you know, every time I go see the doctor, yes. So the Hansen's disease is not a problem? Uh, you know, it's finished already, yeah. It was nothing, uh, you know, just like how before. So you've had so much loss in your life. Is that how you see it? I really, uh, you know, Feel, but you know what's happened with all this thing, uh, you know, they went do. You know, I pray a lot when I came here. I pray so much, you know, for set up me and, and take away all that set to me. Because you had so much sadness and you needed it to be gone. Yes. And how, do you, how did, did the sadness go away? Yes. No, uh, uh, I'm happy right now, plus uh, uh, my husband, they are, they're so nice to me. Because you remarried another time. Yeah. This is your third husband. Yeah, this is your third husband. And he's not a patient. No. How did you meet him? Oh, yeah. He came here, you know, 81, and 81, my husband, and he died. So your third husband was already here as a, a worker? 
not a patient. He just started work. He just came work here. So uh, him the one that was, uh, you know, doing uh, uh, my other husband's uh, uh, graveyard, yeah. And um, after that, they was helping me uh, other things for uh, anything I need, you know. And those days when you, when one cocoa they come in patient's house, they gotta go at the office to sign. You know, I couldn't be at uh, a patient's house and then he gotta put the name. Who's patient? Yeah, that's so, how those days. So he happened to be the kokua yeah. who was cleaning your, hus your husband's grave and then who was helping you out in yeah. your transition. Yeah. And I never asked because I don't know him, you know, but it's how he's work. He's, uh, you know, a carpenter. Oh. Yeah. And um, so after that, uh, you know, uh, everything. And then he said, okay, if you need anything, I can come and help you, whatever you need. I can help you, that's why he said. So I know I know need help because they get the state workers, but he worked in the state too, yeah, at that time, yeah. So when did romance blossom? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, um, 82 to uh, 1995. Then that's why, uh, you know, and I told him that, okay, you know what? Time for, uh, for me, either you, either you marry me or not, then you stay, uh, and you go, you move out, and I stay in my house. Uh, and I never know that, uh, you know, Father Damien was going to be made. I, I really don't know. So all this time, you know, I never take community because, uh, you know, I cannot, they commune and I live with somebody. I, you know, I cannot do that. So, 1995, um, the first week of uh, uh, April, I told him, okay, today is a day. Either you move out or we marry. If you're not married, you move out. If we marry and then you stay, it's all uh, you know. Uh, I cannot do this. Uh, no communion. I only go church and prayer, you know. And then he said, "I want to marry you." No kidding. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't kidding. <laughs> but he was not kidding. <laughs> In May of 1995, the newly married Mei Li Watanuki and her husband Randy were accorded the honor of visiting Rome and meeting with the Pope and bringing back home to Hawaii a relic of the beloved Damien. Mei Li and Randy had only just returned from their honeymoon when they were encouraged to go to the Vatican. Only me is supposed to go because of, uh, you know, Father Damien's uh, day. So and up, uh, you know, uh, he get uh, the call from uh, our priest. He said, okay, you're supposed to go with your wife to go Belgium. I said, okay. So he went to rush his um, uh, passport. And then they come that time, we went. And we never know that he was going, him and I, we going to receive the relic from the Pope, Pope Father Damien, yes. That was quite an honor, wasn't it? Were you chosen for that? We never know. The Pope chose you? Yeah. The Pope was, uh, you know, uh, uh, what a story, uh, you know, after we came, we came back and, uh, I, you know, I wanted to find out how we, we went come true with this, you know. And uh, so they said uh, the Pope went uh, tell the, the, the bishop, you know, for take me. And my husband, we just got married, so I said, that's why they get all this thing? They say, yeah. And what was the relic? It was a nice core. It was really nice. And they get uh, his hand was inside. We stand over there with, uh, you know, the Pope and, uh, you know, all them. And then they bring, uh, you know, so we just put our hand on top, me and my husband. I say, okay. And then they went bless us. Did you feel... What did you feel when you 
held the relic, which was well, Damien's I, hand. I really feel this, you know, all, all that time, you know, this, I only chicken skin, you know, I never know in my life I could not, you know, see the ball face to face with him. I kissed two, two, two times and his ring. Yeah. Wow. Oh, man, is. You know, so many people have done good things at Kalau Papa for the patients. So many, um, just people have sacrificed. What does Father Damien mean to you? He worked hard for the people. He worked hard for the, the poor, poor people. And he, uh, you know, really loved to, uh, to God and take care of uh, the hand's disease. He, uh, you know, he no care what, uh, you know, he um, becomes sick, but it's how he's, uh, you know, he, his uh, heart is for God and take care of the people, take care of the poor. Yeah, just like he, him is a local boy in Hawaii even though they come from Belgium. Mm -hmm. Children are a very sensitive subject in Kalau Papa. At this time in 2009, children under the age of 16 are not allowed in the settlement. This age-old rule was first put in place to protect children from the disease and to save patients from ridicule and embarrassment. Times have changed, with some patients pressing to hear the sound of children in their midst. Meili Watanuki and Clarence Boogie Kahilihiva are on opposite sides of this debate. Yes, uh, I like to see the children before I pass. I like to see the children if, you know, to come here and visit and to stay like a normal um, visitor, like if they say, well, you have your own house, you can stay in your, whoever inviting you, they're going to be your sole responsibility because anything goes wrong, everything going to fall on you. And I like to see that, not only for the patients, but for everybody who's working here. We were talking about the controversy that broke out when one of the patients wanted children to live here. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of us, uh, you know, they never like because, um, when I came here, all the old folks, you know, they, they talk about, you know, uh, they don't like children to come here because some of the kids, they don't understand the sick. Even though, uh, you know, it's no more sick, but they, uh, they still, they might be scared of the people. They might, they could make fun on the people. And another thing, they might the kids, they get sick and it's no more um, medicine here for the kids. Father Damien loved the children especially, you know, and uh, to ban the children over here, maybe they have their own thoughts. You see, before, a couple of years back, we had people who just follow the next friend. They, not, they couldn't think for themselves. If you said no, then I would say no. But I don't look at it that way. I look at it as for myself, how I see everything. And if if uh, majority of you say no, well, I'll go along with that, but not in my heart, you know. You know, when I came over here and, and I hear a lot, uh, you know, about all the rules about the kids, you know, they're not allowed to hear. Uh, I forget what, what year, um, after that, they went open up, went open up one year. So they get, the, you know, the couple, it's a patient here. They went bring the kids. It's about uh, 10, 10 years old, 10 and nine. So what they do, right in the front, uh, you know, our house, they, they use that the kind of, you know, the ski board, whatever, you know, on the rope. And one of the old men, they come in from the other side up, they go, you know, pick up the slab for the pig. You know what's happened? The kids went go right in the front of my house. They went go like this. The old man, they went go straight to the, the stone. He went cut up mm -hmm. and smashed his car. Yeah, and 
we're, we were advised when we came to be very careful in right. driving or, or watch out around you because patients may not have good visual or right. they, they may be slow to react because of right. physical impairment. Right, right. If you go to Kalaupapa, where gravestones are never far away, where history is alive, you can imagine St. Damien walking the same pathways, seeing the same beautiful views, breathing the same ocean breeze. In a life full of twists and turns, Meili Watanuki's faith never wavered. Faced with so much tragedy, she found comfort in God. And with the canonization of the priest she always regarded as a saint, Meili's faith is made even deeper. Thank you, Meili and Boogie, for sharing. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. I'm happy and, and just like I'm, I come more close to Father Damien because, uh, you know, I pray a lot for, for him every day, every morning. And I go over there just like I go talk story with, you know, Father Damien. I just say, Father Damien, please do uh, help this settlement. People kind of behave themselves and be kind one another.